Hey guys, so in this video we're going to be looking at the probability density functions. We're going to find how we can use them to find probabilities relating to continuous variables. So that's really important here, we're talking about continuous variables. Now in the previous video, the introduction to the probability density functions and continuous variables, we looked at how, uh, what they actually are. So the probability density functions, if you remember, were basically when you had a graph and that represents the continuous probability. So you could have, for example, a graph like this with regards to the area underneath at particular intervals would give you the area of those intervals. And we're going to now find out how to find that area underneath and therefore find the probability. Now, just one quick thing I want to mention is last video when we did look at these graphs, I put probability up here and then I put x there when we were drawing. And what I meant by that is that the y axis should basically be y for the fx function. Then the probability shouldn't actually be up there. But rather what I was trying to say with the probability here is that the, area, it ref, the y axis affects the area and so therefore that how it is, that the probability is affected by the y-axis, but I didn't mean that you can't find an x-value here and go up and go across and therefore say that that x-value, the probability of, let's say, 2 is equal to 0 0.3 because that is wrong and rather it's always about the area. You can't look at, for continuous, as I explained, if you understand what continuous variables are, you can't just take one specific point because there aren't one specific point. You have to take an interval. So if you didn't watch that video or you're a bit confused by this, don't worry. It's just wanted to clarify something. And the main thing to remember is that it's always about the area and you have to take an interval, as you will see once we start calculating it. So the best way to show is to use an example. So we'll have a here... Um, we have a function, so a hybrid function. We have half x minus 3 between the domain of 6, x, and 8. And you can see here, it's between 6 and 8, and it's, like, it's out of scale, but it's just to mean we have some more area to see the graph. And we have 0 elsewhere. So the first thing is that we have to check that the pro area underneath, if this is given a question, you don't have to check, but we'll just check it now. We want to make sure that the area underneath is equal to 1, and then we can automatically know that the second condition is satisfied for a probability density function in that the probability is never negative because zero, it's obviously not negative, and half x minus three, it's always positive between the domain we're looking at. Obviously, outside of the domain, it would become negative, but we're only looking at this domain. So firstly, we need to make sure that the area, this total area must equal one, and the total area must equal one because the total probability must also equal 1. Now, how do you find an area underneath the graph? Well, we've already done anti-differentiation earlier in methods, and the anti-diff gives us the area underneath a graph. So, we can find that. So, we anti-diff the function, so half x minus 3 dx, and that gives us the area. But now we need to have sort of two points here, and that's between what domain we want to find the area between, and that's 8 and 6. So here you have 8 and then you put it at the top, so that's you put the highest number on the top, so the highest x value, and then 6 you put here, so then you have 6. And this is going to give us the area, as you can see here. So between 8 and 6 you anti-diff the formula and it will give us this area. Now I've already said that 0, the area of 0 is just 0, that's because you can go anti-diff of 0 dx between any points is just going to equal 0. So we don't need to worry about that. So we just calculate this area. So what we get is that for anti-diffing this, we get x squared 1 on 4, because when you bring the 2 down, you get 2 on 4, which is 1 on 2, and then x minus 3x. And remember, when you anti-diff, you don't need to put the plus c because for working out the area, because what we do is we have a point up here and a point down here and then we minus them and then the c's cancel out as I've shown in, the pre in previous videos so you don't need to worry about the plus c. Then you sub in these points and you get 
a quarter 8 squared, so that's 64, minus 24, so 3 times 8 is 24, minus 6 squared, so that's 36 on 4, minus 18. And this we have 64 on 4, so 64 on 4 is 32 on 2, and 32 on 2 is 16, 16 minus 24 is negative 8, minus 36 on 4, which is 18 on 2, 18 on 2 is 9, 9 minus 18 is negative 9, so negative negative is positive 9 minus 8, and that gives us 1. So that's good, so that means the total area is equal to 1, the function is never negative, so it is a probable, so it can represent a probability density function. So you don't have to do this, I will emphasize, you don't have to do this during the questions because you can just assume this. We're just doing this to show you that this uh, equation does satisfy the conditions. All right, so now we'll go on to a question. So find the probability that x is greater or equal to 7. So that means we want to find the probability that x would... Here, so find the probability that x is greater than 7. So here is 7, and we want to find it's greater than that. So we want to find this area here. Now, when x is greater than 8, it's just 0. So we only care about this area inside. So what we can do here is, to find this area, we once again anti-differentiate. So you have the symbol integral here, then you have 8, so we want to go up to the point 8, and to the point 7, so of 8, 7, and we find this equation here, half x minus 3 dx, and then we just solve. And that will give us x squared 1 on 4, minus 3x, 8, 7, subbing those numbers, and we get 64 on 4, minus 24, minus 49 on 4, minus 21. Maybe you can continue this calculation by hand, or if you had a calculator, it would be a bit easier. So you sub that in, and what you find is that equals 0 0.75. So that means that the chance of the probability, therefore the probability of x being greater or equal to 7 is equal to 0 0.75. So a 75% chance. Now this could represent an actual um, continuous probability for some variables. And so that means you can find that this probability is equal to that. Now note that if x is greater than or equal to 7, it always that counts as an interval because you're going from 7 to sort of infinity but effectively it's just going from 7 to 8. Right, so now going on to another example so the probability of x is greater than 7 given that the x is greater than 6.5 so firstly we, want, we realize it's a conditional probability seeing that given that so we need to now know that the probability of x it's greater than 7, intersection x greater than 6.5 over the probability of x is greater than 6.5. Now, the, this intersection here is just equal to probability of x greater than 7 over the probability of x is greater than 6.5. Now, we just need to work out these two. So that's using the integrals. So firstly up here we'll have the probability of x is greater than 7 is equal to uh, 8, 7, half x minus 3 dx. And then probability of x is greater than 6.5 is equal to 8, 6.5, half x minus 3x dx. And then here you have the graph. So we'll have this, it's going up here to 0.81. 6, 0, as I said, this is not to scale. And then you can see these two different probabilities. So first we're calculating x is greater than 7 here, and then x is greater than 6.5. And then this will give us 0 0.8. So I just use a calculator to find that, and you should be able to find 
these individually. So individually, these were the probability of x greater than 7 is equal to 3 on 4, so 0 0.75, and the probability of x is greater than 6.5 is equal to uh, 15 on 16. And you could find a decimal approximation for that. That's why you can get a nice number, because obviously the, both of these are relatively simple fractions. Um, so that makes sense, it, how it's 80% because it's higher than 75% because it's given that a condition so you don't even have to worry about that because we already know that it's greater than. So it's always good to think if this is a conditional probability do I expect it to be greater than 0 0.75 because remember in the previous question we'd already worked out this was 0 0.75. Video, there are, there are another two things I really want to point out to you that you may have seen using those examples. And the first was when we worked out the probability of x is greater or equal to 7, we found it was 0 0.75. Then when we found the probability of x is greater than 7, we found it was 0 0.75. And that shows us that the probability of x being greater than a, so a is just any number or less than number, is equal to the probability of x being greater than or equal to a. And once again, this equal is because the continuous don't aren't actual values, it's more a range. So saying they're equal to one exact value doesn't change the probability. And this will make sense from the second thing, which is that the probability of x equaling a is equal to zero. And you can show that by saying that you had the previous example, we had a graph such as that, so it was like half x minus uh, three, and then we'll say that x is equal to 7. So if we sub that in, we had 7 on 2, which is 3 on 2 minus 3, so that's a half. And then we'd have 7 here, 7 here, which is half dx. But obviously, having integral with two numbers equal to each other is just going to give us um, a half x. So that's going to give us 7 on 2 minus 7 on 2, because these numbers are going to be the same, which will always give us 0 because the area at one specific point is always going to be zero. And that sort of also explains why this is the case. So there are two important features that you really do need to remember for looking at continuous functions.